magic button. Uh, hi, this is Bob Westervelt. Um, I'm glad uh, to introduce today uh, Ali uh, Fahim Nia uh, uh, from uh, the uh, Joint Quantum Institute at University of Maryland. Um, he obtained his uh, PhD from MIT working with Leonid Levitov in uh, 2021. He's going to be talking about a sort of really interesting thing that happens with two-dimensional materials is that the transport of the electrons is uh, really uh, quite different than it is in regular conductors. And particularly, he's going to uh, address something that I learned about when I was a uh, young kid, but never seen before, which are these block oscillations. Uh, you have when electron hits near the Brillouin zone, it actually turns around and comes back. And uh, it's quite fascinating when the professor first tells you that, you don't quite believe that it's true, but you'll uh, learn uh, the, the way it really works today. Uh, so, Ali, thanks. Thanks, Bob, uh, a lot for your introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for tuning in for my talk today. Uh, as Bob said, I was previously, uh, I'm now at the University of Maryland, joined Quantum Institute, and previously I was at MIT, you know, working with Liana Levitov. And this is a work that I did during my PhD, and it was actually funded by the Center for Integrated Quantum Materials. Um, I'm going to be talking about block oscillations, and we've all seen it in the first few lectures of solid states uh, that this phenomenon arises in periodic lattices. Uh, how it arises is that when you look at the dynamics of free electrons, let's say, uh, they have this uh, quadratic energy dispersion. And when you apply an electric field, the electron starts to uh, move in the momentum space like a Newton's, due to Newton's law. And then because it also moves in the uh, band spectrum towards higher energies, it starts to have a velocity and then the velocity goes higher and higher and it accelerate, accelerates. So this is an indefinite acceleration due to constant field. Uh, but the, this picture is distorted when the electron is moving in a lattice, in a periodic potential like a lattice. Uh, and the main difference arises because of the existence of band gaps. The previously quadratic dispersion relation is now dissected into different bands separated by these band gaps. And the question is, when the electron reaches the band edge, uh, edge of the band gap, what's going to happen? The answer to this question is that if the electric field is weak enough, the wave packet, instead of moving higher in energy, will actually uh, will go to the other edge of the brillouin zone in a phenomenon that is called Bragg scattering. And we've all seen it in our solids courses. And then by moving to the other side. Sorry to interrupt. But your sides aren't moving. Uh, sorry? Oh, your slides aren't moving. Aren't moving? Aren't moving. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, how about now? Yes, we're good. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, it was paused. Thank you. Yeah, um, as just a very sh short review of what I said already, we are uh, talking about electrons put in under an applied electric field. When there, there is no periodic potential, there is no potential. This is an indefinite acceleration due to Newton's law. When there's an periodic potential, bands form. And when the electron reaches the edge of one band in its uh, movement in the momentum space, if the electric field is, in, is weak enough, the Bragg scattering can happen and the electron will move to the other edge of the same band and then continue this periodic movement that is called block oscillation. And in this movement, the electron starts to accelerate, then decelerate, come to stationary, and then actually move in the other direction. So if we look at the 
real space dynamics, it is going to be just oscillation in the same, around the same point. And this is some um, stark prediction of non-classical, but it's still Newtonian equations of motion, plus some periodic uh, bad dispersion, which gives you a periodic velocity. Uh, and the phenomenon is that we have now oscillations that are induced by a constant force, kind of sort of contradictory. Uh, and moreover, all the carriers participate in the oscillations and remarkably do it at the same frequency that's called the block frequency. And of course, we know that whenever we apply an electric field, this is not what happens. Uh, electrons actually conduct current and move from one side to the other side instead of oscillating in uh, the same point. Uh, why, why is that? The reason is the fast uh, so existence of fast momentum relaxations due to phonons and disorders and other uh, sources and electrons before going around the brilliant zone actually are scattered by these sources and don't get to see the brilliant zone and oscillate. Uh, can we make it happen? This is going to be the story that I'm going to tell you today. But before that, why this is an exciting phenomenon. Uh, it's a striking prediction of the band theory and non-classical Newtonian motion. And it is probably the simplest uh, collective many body dynamics of electrons that we can imagine. Uh, and it poses new opportunities uh, in the space dimensions higher than one, where one can add magnetic field and or like uh, Berry phase and Berry curvature. And it also suggests uh, a route to applications of immense practical interest uh, for filling the infamous stellar gap. Uh, with electronics and photonics, there are a multitude of technology uh, in long wavelengths and short wavelengths uh, spectrum of the electromagnetic waves. But then in the terahertz range, there is a lack of technological advancements and the block wave, block oscillations lying in these frequencies can uh, present new opportunities for new advancements. With this motivation, uh, today I focus on basic physics and uh, some basic physics questions and discuss what's interesting about this phenomena. This is the outline of my talk and I will cover uh, three general topics. I will, first I will continue in my introduction to block oscillations and talk about where we can find them and make the case for more materials. Uh, then I'll move to uh, two dimensional block oscillations and how to achieve uh, collective oscillations such that all electrons move in sync. And finally, I'll talk about magnetic block oscillations and then and the peculiar dynamical phase that is induced by the magnetic field. Uh, what does it take to see these oscillations and what are the requirements? Uh, as I said, scattering is the main enemy of the oscillations. And therefore, to mask them, uh, the key is to have a very narrow band in order to block uh, phonon scatterings and also have high mobility in order to block momentum scattering. What's the optimal lattice constant? The larger it is, the better. Uh, because that way we can see this phenomena at weaker electric fields. Uh, where do we find such a system? Unfortunately, there are no crystals that have these desired properties. Therefore, people from years ago 
try to create synthetic super lattices using stacks of uh, semiconductor quantum bells. Uh, and here I show some of the results from uh, one of the success, more successful experiments that goes back to 2004. How much did it work? It was actually a steady progress for years and many signatures of the block oscillations were found in these systems. But unfortunately, uh, it wasn't the most successful. And even though there are some, the, 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 they saw some of the signatures, but the experiments encountered uh, charge instabilities at these high electric fields due to stacking geom special stacking geometry of these quantum wells. So no oscillations, but is there a hope? And my main goal today is to convince you that yes, there is, and we are going to use modeling materials that were introduced like maybe four years ago. Modeling materials are actually one of the main focuses of the center. And what are those? These are uh, super lattices that are emergent long wavelength lattices actually, uh, that form when uh, we have a mismatch between uh, two or more uh, sub lattices. And for example, the twisted bilayer, the famous twisted bilayer graphene in this picture is formed because of mismatch that is a result of twist. And then these uh, modeling materials are pristine crystal, pristine super lattices. And in some cases, they host super narrow block bands. Like for the model, for the twisted bilayer graphene, I show bandwidth for different twist angles. And you can see that the, these but narrow bands are actually tunable by the twist. And when we check the other requirement list against these modeling materials, we see that all of them check. They have the narrow bands and also large phonon uh, frequency compared to the bandwidths. Also, they have ultra low disorder compared to quantum bells because they are pristine crystals. Uh, and large periodicity, which is actually similar to that of quantum well super lattices. And even more, as I showed, uh, the bandwidths and the Molly period, both are tunable by the twist angle. And we believe that the charge and the stabilities will be suppressed in the 2D layout of these materials because of an existence of a nearby a metallic gate that is going to induce a constant chemical potential and, and as a result, a constant charge density. The interesting, there are many interesting theory questions. I'm going to discuss three of them today. First, I'm going to talk about the difference between 2D versus 1D geometry. Then, I'll talk about the synchronized collective dynamics. And finally, I move to magnetic block oscillations. Let's talk about block oscillations in two dimensions and how to synchronize them. What, uh, what is going to be new in dimensions higher than one? It is still Newton's law, and it dictates that the rate uh, of the momentum change is determined by the electric field. But this electric field now can be in an arbitrary direction with relative to the lattice. And we can describe it by going to the momentum space and seeing what happens to, a, to an electron wave packet. So imagine this electron starting from the center of the Brazilian zone. And this is a hexagonal Brazilian zone that is going to be the case for the modeling materials. When the applied electric field is in this direction, initially the electron will start to move in the direction of the electric field. And 
when the electron reaches the boundary of the Galilean zone, similar to the one dimension, a Bragg scattering is going to happen, an electron will move to the opposite edge of the Galilean zone. Then continue in the direction of the electric field until it reaches the boundary, then Bragg scatters to the other edge, continues in the direction of the electric field, and this happens over and over again. The result is winding of the electron wave packet around Galilean zone, and this can be at any generic angle. Therefore, this linear movement in the momentum space accounts for the Newton's law, together with a periodic band dispersion, and as a result, band velocity translates to the oscillatory movement of the electron in the real space. The important takeaway is that the frequencies, I'm going to describe how to get them, are only determined by the geometry of the brilliant zone. They, they don't depend on uh, the band properties, uh, like bandwidths or other things. How can we understand the frequency spectrum? This is a nice geometry problem, and I'm going to discuss two equivalent ways of, of how to get the frequencies um, using a real space lattice. So what I show here are the real space lattice points. And then for an electric field in a generic direction um, that is described by this black arrow here, we can find the frequencies by, uh, by connecting each point perpendicularly to this direction. And each result is going to be one frequency of the block oscillation. Or equivalently, we can look at this rosette of uh, circles in the real space. And each circle is for each of these, these uh, real space lattice points. And the frequencies are found by this by the intersection of the electric field direction and these circles. This picture can help us imagine what's going to be the evolution of the frequencies if we start to rotate the electric field. And then we can see how the frequencies will, will evolve. The manifestations are that we get these frequencies in the current spectrum. What's that? If we look at each electron moving in space, so therefore there's a corresponding current. And if we look at the current current correlation spectrum, the power spectrum that we get from this will be a comb like power spectrum. And the frequencies of this power spectrum are, that are described in this geometric way that I explained. The frequencies are incommensurate, and we can get them because, because of their origin in the real space lattice. We can uh, explain them by two incommensurate frequencies, and then all the resonances of those two frequencies. And once again, the main takeaway is that the frequencies are solely determined by the geometry of the problem, and they have no dependence on the band dispersion. So far, uh, I have discussed the dynamics of single electron and what's going to happen when we uh, have an applied electric field and electron moves in the momentum space. But in reality, we have many, many electrons in the conduction band. And the electron, the random scattering of these electrons uh, resets them at different times and therefore gives each block oscillation a random phase. And there is no coherency between the different block oscillations of these many, many electrons. Do we still see anything after these random phases? Yes, there are signatures in both DC and AC conductivity. Here I'm gonna describe what happens in the, if you look at the DC conductivity, but you can ask me later about what's there for, for DC conductivity, AC conductivity. So let's look at 
current or equivalently the lift velocity uh, as a function of the electric field strength. At small electric fields, the current grows linearly with the applied electric field, which is just Ohm's law. But then later, uh, it saturates at field strengths that are determined by the, the scattering rate, as we see here. And finally, the drift velocity goes down with a negative differential conductivity. Achieving this negative differential conductivity regime uh, tells us that electrons before being reset, uh, get to travel around the momentum space and complete a few periods of their block oscillations. And therefore we have reached the block oscillation regime. But unfortunately, we won't see any coherent oscillations. And the only oscillations that we get at this point are out of sync. And we can only see those as a noise signal with the same frequencies as described. Therefore, we need a way to synchronize the carriers to have coherent oscillations. How to do it? Our proposal to achieve synchronized oscillations is by making individual electrons talk to the same source, which is an oscillator here that is like a power in the sky. Um, which is similar to the fire here, metaphorically, that uh, motivates the folks to dance. Now, if this happens, we expect collective synchronized oscillations when the block frequency is near the oscillation frequency. We, we expect a resonance. The problem that we solve is a simple Hamiltonian of individual electrons that move in a band with an applied electric field, and then a simple harmonic oscillator as a resonator, and the coupling between the two. We go on and solve this problem analytically and find collective resonances uh, that are short as we expected. I'm going to describe, explain what the results are. Uh, when the block frequency is, when the block frequency of the electrons is near the oscillator frequency, uh, if the coupling alpha between electrons and the oscillator is strong enough, the system develops an instability towards a synchronized state. This instability in analytics is seen as Close in the oscillation amplitude of the resonator. And by looking at this uh, flowchart here, when we are in this uh, regime of indefinite close of the oscillation amplitude, what happens is that the oscillator acts to synchronize the electrons and now this synchronized electrons by the coupling to the oscillator pump energy back to the oscillator and therefore oscillator starts to, the oscillation amplitude starts to grow. And which is similar to, a, to the lasing problem. In this phase diagram here, I show you when this regime is achieved uh, as a function of applied electric field and the coupling is the length between, block block, uh, the, between electrons and the oscillator, the synchronization happens near resonance and when the coupling is length is strong enough. In the unstable regime, it is, in the stable regime, it is like Fourier style dancing of electrons, which are asynchronous uh, oscillations. But in the unstable regime, we have lockstep dancing. Oscillations are synchronized and electrons turn into sort of nano soldiers all marching together. 
and then also pumping energy to the oscillator. So far, I described the dynamics in two dimensions and also one proposal to synchronize different electrons together. But maybe before moving on to the next part, it is a good point to see if there are any questions. I see a question in the Q&A and chat. Oh, okay. And okay, so the question. If not, you can move on. Oh, okay. Okay, like a true physicist, we're gonna add magnetic field to the problem and describe the regimes of block oscillations in the presence of a magnetic field. In the presence of a magnetic field, we expect an interesting interplay between block oscillations as a result of the electric field and cyclotron dynamics as a result of the applied magnetic field. How can we describe it? At weak, and I'm gonna tell you what weak is, at weak fields, it's okay to continue using the quasi-classical quasi equations of motion. We just need to add the magnetic Lorentz force in the Newton's law. This dynamics um, has a surprising new property, which is the translation invariance. Uh, the quasi-classical equation of motion uh, does not know about the underlying lattice that breaks the translation invariance. Uh, where does this emergent symmetry come from? Its origin uh, is that at weak fields, Electron wave packets are, uh, in, in weak fields, electron wave packets are large compared to the lattice periodicity. And the emergent trans, this emergent translation invariance is gonna obviously break at higher fields because then the electron wave packets are gonna be more and more localized and start to see the underlying lattice. And for us in, more super lattices that are our goal. They have large periods, but if we do the mass with regard to the magnetic field, this approximation tells us that the quasi-classical equations of motions are still valid up to a few Tesla fields. Therefore, we're gonna have lots of room to continue working with this quasi-classical equations of motion. At higher fields, however, new regimes will arise, like how pushed out a butterfly, um, in which the translation invariance is broken, and the quantum hole effect. I'm not gonna be talking about those today. Instead, I'll carry on with the translation invariant equations of motion, and do some numerical simulations of the equations of motion uh, by considering an electron wave packet with an initial momentum and then finding its orbit in the momentum space. And then because I know the velocity for each momentum, translating the, moment, the trajectory in the momentum space to a trajectory in the real space. And these are some of the results that we get. These are orbits of electrons in real space under applied both an electric and the magnetic field. And regarding the value of the electric field, it is such that we are already in the Bloch regime. At a small enough magnetic fields, the electrons oscillate in the real space. And if we look at the power spectrum, we see two incommensurate frequencies and their resonances. This is very reminiscent of the case for zero magnetic field and the block oscillations. We call these oscillations, these orbits electric type. If we move to larger magnetic fields, at large enough magnetic fields, the electrons, uh, 
oscillate, if you look at the Pablo spectrum, oscillate at single cycles, cycle, cycles of frequency and its harmonics. And in the real space, they actually drift in the direction perpendicular to the electric field. And this is a normal drift, both at direction that is uh, described by cross product of electric and magnetic fields, but also at magnitude. And we call these orbits magnetic top. So we have found two distinct regimes and we're gonna speculate the experimental manifestations and also try to understand what happens at the phase boundary. One experimental manifestation, obviously, when we have a magnetic field and an electric field is the Hall current or equivalently uh, drift velocity that I show a diagram of drift velocity here which is always perpendicular to the direction of the electric field. Uh, the, looking at the colors in this plot, we see the two distinct regimes. Uh, there's a, for the small electric field, so strong magnetic fields, there is this magnetic regime. Uh, and at large enough magnetic fields, what we get is no drift velocity, and which is a signature of block oscillations happening and electrons are moving and therefore not having a drift velocity. And there is a sharp transition between these two regimes when we tune the relation between electric and magnetic field. And but near the transition, if we zoom in here, uh, there is actually a regime where electrons, the drift velocity has the opposite sign of a normal drift velocity, which is shown by color blue here. It is interesting. I'm going to come to it uh, later. But first, let's see if we can understand this short transition uh, in the dynamics. How to understand these behaviors? Let's go back to our equations of motions in the momentum and real space. By a closer look, we can understand that we actually do not need the real space picture uh, to understand the dynamics in the momentum space. The momentum space, the equations for the momentum space uh, is self-sufficient. We can, it's a simpler task. Uh, we can just look at what happens for the momentum of a wave packet on the applied electric and magnetic fields, uh, and then think about the dynamics in the real space. This equations of motion that is here is actually integrable with a quasi energy that is a Doppler shifted band energy. So this is what I will call Ashcroft and Merman quasi energy. It's, it was introduced by them, which is just band energy plus a Doppler shift. And then the dynamics is very similar to moving uh, an electron moving on an applied magnetic field with just different velocity that is coming from this quasi energy instead of the band energy. This dynamics is, tells us that the Ashcroft and Merman quasi energy is gonna be, oh, sorry. The Ashcroft and Merman quasi energy is a conserved quantity, very similar to the band energy being conserved under an applied magnetic field. And this conserved quantity and the constant of motion uh, means that in the momentum space, the trajectories are gonna be such that they will go along the contours of this uh, Ashcroft and Merman quasi-energy. 
Okay. Now we know how to do the orbits. Let me check time. Okay. Now we know how to do the orbits in the momentum space without needing any numerical simulations. We just need to look at the contours of the quasi energy and then think about uh, the orbits in the real space as well. Let's do it. Uh, what I'm showing here uh, is a momentum space picture and some trajectories or contours of the Ashkarov and Merman quasi energy. But this momentum space picture is a little bit different than what I was showing before. So this is in the extended zone scheme. Whenever the wave packet reaches the edge of, edge of the band, instead of describing the black scattering, I'm gonna continue showing the wave packet in the extended zone. But then we know that we can draw many brilliant zones and then it is just going to be in the next brilliant zone and the next brilliant zone. If I were to fold everything into the first brilliant zone, that would be the black scattering and the winding that I described before. Okay, what do I get? The small magnetic fields. Uh, then what, what happens is that uh, the Doppler shift of the Ashcroft and Melman energy, because you can see that it is proportional to one over V, is very large and orbits are similar to um, electric orbits that come from this Doppler uh, shift plus some wobbling. So they are very similar to linear orbits plus some wobbling in the momentum space. And then very similar to the block oscillations in absence in the absence of magnetic field, the orbits in the momentum in the real space are just oscillations around the same point in the real space. So the picture here is that the orbits in the extended scheme are extended in the momentum space, but confined in the real space. Let's move on to large magnetic fields, higher magnetic fields. Now the Doppler shift is weak and it is not enough to escape from the band extrema. Like here near the band minimum for the choice of band dispersion that I have here, the orbits are closed. And therefore electrons do not get to see different brilliant zones. They do not, they are not like extended orbits in the momentum space. They are now confined orbits in the, moment, in the momentum space. And if you look at the velocity, we can show that, okay, now they are gonna be drifting with a normal drift in the momentum, in the real space. So we get, as soon as we develop some closed orbits, we will gonna have this abrupt transition in the orbit geometry that is translated to the abrupt, uh, the sharp transition in the drift velocity or the Hall current. One interesting property is this duality between position space and the momentum space. Uh, Whenever we have extended orbits in one of them, we get confined orbits in the other. Then another surprising thing is that uh, the normal drift that we get for the closed orbits in the momentum space is actually equal to the normal drift that we get for the free electron. The surprise is that the normal drift is usually argued with the Lorentz symmetry of the space time. But here for an arbitrary choice of band dispersion uh, that can break the Lorentz symmetry, we did not expect to have the Lorentz drift. Nevertheless, we can show that it, it has to be the Lorentz drift 
for any closed orbit. Last, let me check time. Okay, last, I'm gonna go back to these orbits and talk about one last orbit that I didn't mention. Uh, I sort of escaped from low electric field to high electric field, but then there's, there's this interesting orbit in between that is moving in the opposite direction. If you remember, we had this regime of blue hull um, current in the phase diagram that I showed, and it is also particles drifting in the opposite direction. These are those uh, orbits. It was puzzling at first, but with this momentum picture that we have developed, it is easy to understand how we get opposite drift. When we have some region in the momentum space that orbits are closed, there still are some orbits that are extended in the momentum space. So when an electron is moving in these extended orbits, a naive guess would be that, okay, they should oscillate like any, like previous extended orbits. But the difference is that these orbits see momentum space, but never get to region of the momentum space that have these closed orbits. And therefore, if we average the drift velocity, and we know the average of the drift velocity for the beryllium zone is zero, we miss the parts that have the normal drift velocity. And therefore, the average drift velocity for extended orbits in the presence of some closed orbits in the momentum space is gonna be of the opposite sign. And therefore, there's gonna be a sort of chaotic behavior in the opposite direction. With this, I hope it is on time. I get to my summary. We saw, uh, I talked about this exotic driven quantum system uh, that gives us collective carrier dynamics, a very simple one. And I also talked about the dynamical transition uh, for the magnetic block oscillations and complex behavior near the described transition. All of this is of practical interest and also very interesting for theoretical endeavors. Uh, the most of these most of the topics are published in this paper and the Magnetic parts are going to be published soon. In the future, it is still there are still many questions, many exciting questions uh, about this topic, and like we can study the block oscillations as quantum flux dynamics. We can also uh, start looking at high magnetic fields and the living quantum hall systems that we're gonna get there. Also, there are new effects that are gonna be there because of a Berry phase uh, in the momentum space, for example, in topological bands. And of course, one uh, interesting direction uh, that is pursued within the center for integrated quantum materials is trying to see these phenomena in experiments. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna be answering any questions. Okay, th thank you uh, very much for, please type them the way the software works. Please say some in, in chat or let's look in uh, Q and A. Zhang uh, says, does this require low temperatures? Question mark. So yes, because I mentioned that, okay, we, but by the narrow bands, we do not have uh, scattering by optical phonons, but there is still all acoustic phonons. And acoustic phonons are more strongly coupled to electrons in the moiré materials than pristine graphene, let's say. 
And in higher temperatures, we're going to have the problem of scattering by this acoustic phonons. Therefore, we need not super low the dilution of pH temperatures, but we need rather low temperatures such that these acoustic phonons are also damped. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from Bert Halperin. Uh, what are the effects of residual dissipation? Yeah, this is also another interesting question that uh, we have thought about. And in the presence of this residual dissipation, actually what we get is not this uh, deterministic dynamics that I described in this talk, but the dynamics is gonna be sort of uh, this deterministic dynamics plus some random scatterings. Uh, and then it can, for example, in the uh, Hall regime can have this, uh, in the presence of magnetic field can have this effect of moving electrons from extended orbits to the region that are closed orbits. And then, for example, can make them explore this, the parts that the orbits are closed more than the orbits are, that are open. And therefore, uh, moving away well, from this regime of uh, ergodicity that we uh, assumed. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question from uh, Ganendra Singh. Uh, can electrons dynamically transition from one closed orbit to another closed orbit, escaping extended orbit space? Question mark, uh, connected question. Uh, does any mathematical uh, model exist to explain this behavior? Yeah, we actually, this is like this previous question in some sense that uh, let's see. Okay, yeah. In the presence of some residual scattering, the orbits are not going to be determined by this uh, trajectories of uh, that are contours of the Ashcroft and Milman quasi energy. Instead, the particle can move randomly from one orbit to the other, and. Uh, Therefore, yeah, move from one closed orbit to the other closed orbit, or maybe more interestingly, it was the case that when the orbit that crosses the minimum of the band itself is not a closed orbit, but rather an extended orbit, but there is a region in the momentum space that we have closed orbits, and these random scatterings, even though for the bottom of the band or the particles that are stuck on the bottom of the band, uh, are these extended orbits and therefore sort of oscillating orbits, but then the scattering tends to move them to the region of closed orbits and therefore uh, tends to push us into this quantum, uh, to, to this magnetic phase. Okay, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Any uh, last questions people would like to ask, please type quickly. Okay, if uh, not, thank you very much. A very interesting uh, talk, Ego. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.